The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. You've likely heard this word a lot at work, at school, maybe on your favorite current affairs television show. Tonight, we'll connect with the evolving meanings of the word allyship. Then, how our personal photo histories expose the upheaval of life amidst this pandemic. It's Wednesday, January 19th, and that's all next on The Agenda. As 2021 came to a close, the website dictionary.com chose the popular social justice term allyship as its word of the year. And while that word is bandied about a great deal, even those who use it don't always mean the same thing. So joining us now for more on that, we welcome in Montreal, Quebec, Danny Joe Otu, Director of Communications for the nonpartisan youth advocacy organization, Apathy is Boring. In Vaughan, Ontario, researcher and community organizer, Ariana Maliocco. In the provincial capital in Kensington Market, cultural critic, Sarah Barzak, who's a director at the London School of Racialized Leaders, and in Greektown, high school student Isaiah Shafkat, who is the Indigenous Student Trustee at the Toronto District School Board. And it's great to have you four with us here on TVO tonight. I want to start just because I don't want to assume that our audience, you know, for some of them, this is going to be a new term. And I want to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about here when we talk about allyship. And it may mean different things to different people. So let's start. Danny Joe, to you, it means what? To me, allyship, amongst many other things, um, really is a question of decentering or folks with a privileged identity decentering their needs um, and oftentimes, you know, their opportunities and financial gains in order to center and acknowledge the needs of the most marginalized. Okay, Ariana, how about you? I would say that allyship is identifying where your skills, resources, and power can be utilized to support the work of people who are already engaging in political, social activism around their own lived experience, and then actioning on that on an ongoing basis. Sarah. Um, I think Danny Joe and Ariana hit some really great points in terms of identifying um, power, positionality, and like marginalization. Um, I would also add that allyship also exists in the micro intimacies. It exists in how we conduct our relationships to one another. And I'm also interested in how allyship exists in the context of friendships. Micro intimacies meaning what? The, the small actions, like um, in, um, I'd say in my own personal experience, I was I went through a housing crisis actually over this pandemic for 10 weeks. And that is a form of class oppression in some ways or classism, if we think about it, um, socioeconomic disparities. No one could, have, could actually like change my situation, but allies came forward to me as friends, like being able to ask me if I, if I was fed, offering me a place to stay. Danny Joe was one of those folks who was a real ally in that moment by being just a really great friend. Um, so I don't always think it exists in the form of protest. I think it exists in the form of just showing up for one another. Gotcha. Okay, Isaiah, what would you add to what we've heard so far? Um, just reiterating that allyship is decentering oneself on an issue and also accepting that you will not have all the answers or the lived experience to accurately know how an issue affects a group and it's also willing to be uncomfortable and accept that historically one's ancestors may have been perpetrators of the injustices that we witness and face today and it's also always being willing to learn and gain a deeper understanding of an issue okay danny joe coming back to you because i suspect a lot of people watching this right now and listening to it on podcast first heard the term allyship as it related to the protests around black lives matter and I wonder whether, in your view, the term has taken on a different meaning since the BLM protest took place. Um, absolutely. I think, in general, our collective consciousness and awareness of the word in and of itself has greatly 
changed since the Black Lives Matter uh, movement took a, took a rise. I actually also think that in, in some ways the term has um, lost some of its significance um, and maybe been interpreted differently. And I think that, you know, in some cases, some people thought that posting a black square on Instagram would be enough and, and would, you know, identify as, a, as an action of allyship. And, and sometimes that's just, that's just not enough. And so I think that the ways in which um, it's changed are both good and bad. We've become more aware of what it means to be an ally, but sometimes we stay stuck in performative allyship and actually forget that true allyship requires us um, to oftentimes, let, as I mentioned earlier, take a, a loss. So say no to a gig and you know, share the microphone, share a platform, decenter ourselves um, in order to amplify another's voice. It's more than just pushing the like button on Facebook is what you're saying. Yeah, like or share. <laughs> like or share, got it. I want to read something here that Sarah wrote in a passage in an essay that she's been working on, and it starts like this. I wonder, she writes, would there be a word for allyship if we all chose to love and care with intentionality? Would there be a word for allyship if we reevaluated our understandings of friendship? Okay, Sarah, you've asked some good questions there. You got any good answers for us? Yeah, so that essay was inspired by um, just a lot of reflections I had. Um, one in which I just mentioned previously, I was displaced for 10 weeks and I was really reflecting on my friendships that really came through in that time and kind of what love and care meant. Um, a lot of it was inspired by the work of Bell Hooks, who has recently passed. Um, she is a Black feminist who has informed a lot of my views on love and connection and how we um, conduct our interpersonal relationships with intentionality and care. So when I really dug into it, allyship in its everyday context exists in its friendships. It exists in the small actions of micro intimacies. It exists in, you know, being able to check in on each other and being able to show up for one another, um, protests and and you know saying no to a gig or sharing the mic, those are all very very important actions. But I feel like in order for us to have a sense of collective solidarity and unionship, it has to really exist in kind of these small actions for us to be very intentional in how we conduct our day to day relationships. Sarah, I don't want to invade your privacy here, but you you are a guest on a television show, and twice now you've mentioned the fact that you found yourself in a precarious situation in terms of your housing for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us how that happened? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's not a very unique story. I think, if anything, it kind of garnered my Toronto cred credentials. It started off with a, a landlord dispute. Um, <laughs> and that's very, very common here in Toronto. And of course, with the cost of housing and precarious work in the middle of a pandemic, I'm definitely not unique uh, in this experience. And so what had happened was... Um, we were my roommates and I were forced to break our lease and I didn't have a place to stay. So I was basically house hopping, couch surfing for a number of weeks while also, you know, living my life. I still had a job to do. I was still appearing on different uh, platforms such as CTV for election night while still sleeping on couches. And it just so happened that even the next apartment that I had locked had also run into another pest problem, which prolonged my displacement from four weeks to 10 weeks. But you're okay now. I'm okay now. Everything's great Good. now, but I've had a lot of support. Um, and it came in these, in these ways in which friends had really shown up for me and checked in on me and offered me a place to stay or, you know, offered to send me care packages, things like that. Great. Uh, Isaiah, let's get you back in here. September 30th, 2021, the first national day for truth and reconciliation. So I want to ask, what does being an ally for Indigenous people in Canada look like to you? It really just looks like educating oneself and using a platform that they have to, um, rather, to uh, raise Indigenous voice, to, you know, amplify those voices and not take away from that. 
and it's learning through school, through indigenous people specifically. Like we are still here and we still have a voice. And I think that's often ignored. Amplifying as opposed to taking away. How does that work? So instead of and taking an indigenous person's story or lived experience and telling that, you bring an indigenous person in and give them the platform to tell their own story from a firsthand perspective. Gotcha. Okay, Ariana, I want to, where are we going to go here? I want to read something now that you wrote. This is for your master's thesis in social justice education at the University of Toronto. And you look at a phrase commonly used by Italian Canadians, of which you are one. And, uh, okay, Sheldon, let's bring this graphic up and I'll read this along. I'm not white, I'm Italian, is a commonplace statement amongst the community of Italian Canadians I grew up with. It was a statement I can remember saying defensively as a teenager. I believe that we must speak about our collective power as white Italian Canadians in community with one another. All right, let's hone in on that phrase there. I'm white, I'm not white, I'm Italian. What are the issues around that that made you want to write about that? Yeah, well, I think that the the issues really emerged for me, especially during the summer of 2020, when the conversations around white privilege and white supremacy were really elevated to a mainstream conversation. Uh, and I began reflecting on this statement that I'd heard within our community. You know, I'm not white, I'm Italian. And I realized if there are so many Italian Canadians who hold so much power, who don't see themselves as white, then these conversations that are finally being elevated to the mainstream are going right over their heads. Um, and so it was really important for me to start interrogating where this idea comes from and how a familial and ancestral history of migration and in many cases, exclusion from Anglo-Canadian mainstream upon arrival uh, in Canada has been used as a sort of shield from accusations of racism or as a way to say, well, I was oppressed too. And so, you know, fill in the blanks. Either I don't have responsibilities to address the ways that I still participate in white supremacy and settler colonialism, or I can sort of wash my hands and say, well, I, I made it. And so why can't others? All right, I take your point, but um, let me follow up with this. The fact is, if you're a person of a certain age, and I might be in that age, uh, closer to my age than your age, let's put it that way, there were many Italian Canadians who, particularly all over the country, were treated like second-class citizens. And if you are a person in your 60s, 70s, or 80s right now, and you're an Italian Canadian, can you understand why they, why they may not want to join in your in your notion that they are somehow white oppressors as opposed to having been oppressed themselves. Yeah, well, I think you actually raise a really good point, and that's what I think is so important about the community organizing I do with Italian Canadians for Black Lives. Um, here's the thing. The experiences of discrimination, um, of exclusion, are very real. But the way that we honor my family's history with that is not by participating in the same systems which caused them harm. What's more is the reason that Italian Canadians were able to achieve the sort of collective power and upward mobility that they did was because of their proximity to whiteness. The fact that we have light skin color privilege is what helped us to gain the kind of power that we have. And so I really, really believe that if we actually care about those hurt, about those experiences, about that trauma, we do something by making sure that no one has to experience that again, not by becoming the people that we, you know, believe hurt our, our families. Danny Joe, I wonder how you react to that. Uh, the, the notion that if you're white, you potentially uh, can't quite see the kind of advantages you've had, even if you've been disadvantaged or treated like a second class citizen in the past. How do, how do you uh, work out all that in your head? Um, you know, I think when we're having these conversations, it's, it's important to um, maybe reiterate that privilege is not the, the notion that you haven't had to fight for where, you at, for where you're at. It's the notion that there are certain difficulties or barriers, barriers that you don't have to face because of a certain identity. Um, and so I also think it's important that when we speak of privilege, we 
decenter uh, a little bit racial privilege because yes, that's a very ma main and probably the biggest one. But then there's also um, privilege that identifies or that happens at different levels of intersections. And so, you know, I am a educated black woman that gives me privilege over non-educated um, well, black folks from the LGBTQIA community. Um, you know, a white heterosexual male has privileged over a white queer male. And so I think that identifying privilege as um, the experiences that we haven't had to live because of our identities already softens the conversations a little bit and releases the tensions and also allows folks to uh, realize which identities serve them um, in ways that they, they don't necessarily serve other people. Let me do a follow-up with you on this, uh, because I can imagine a 55-year-old white male who's homeless, I don't know that that person feels that they have um, privilege over a very well-educated young black woman. Do you see absolutely. that? Absolutely. I absolutely do feel see that. That's why for me, I'm over the course of the pandemic, I've been extremely loud about um, homelessness and precarious living because that's a privilege that I have to, to I've, I've had to experience, and it's it's a a barrier that I haven't had to live. And so I'm using my platform and my voice to advocate for homelessness um, in ways that I would hope that others with you know intersecting identities that privilege. That, that have privilege over mine, um, do the same. Okay, let me introduce something here called Blackout Tuesday, uh, which again, and Sheldon, let's bring this graphic up and we can read along. Hashtag Blackout Tuesday made visible the sheer number of people who had otherwise been silent on issues of racial justice. However, I found myself wondering, imagine if the number of people who posted a black square showed up fully in support of black and indigenous peoples. Ariana, you wrote that, so I'm coming back to you. Let's just do a little bit of background here. Blackout Tuesday is what? Blackout Tuesday was a social media trend that actually um, emerged out of a different campaign, The Show Must Be Paused, which was a very specific effort to draw attention to racism within the music industry. Um, it ended up gaining huge amounts of popularity um, and as many people might know, it resulted in a lot of people taking to their social media platforms to post a black square um, signaling solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. And did you think it was a real thing or did you think it was showbiz? I think that it was um, a way to identify yourself as somebody who was an ally in the least effective way possible, um, or in a way that required very little actual action. I don't think that posting the square itself is the problem. I think the problem is when people thought that the work of engaging in conversations around anti-racism started and stopped with um, an Instagram post that largely had very little context um, at all. All right, let's get some more views on that. Sarah, what did you think of Blackout Tuesday? I definitely felt it was very performative. Um, you know, suddenly folks who I know know very, very little if or even discuss racial inequalities are suddenly putting all these black squares. Like it, to me, it was it felt like just a big hurrah online. And I don't know, I, I'm a non-black racialized person, so I can't speak to the experience of anti-blackness, but as a racialized person, I still felt that it didn't feel genuine or like intentional or authentic in its in its in its actions. Isaiah, part of it was designed to create solidarity with indigenous people as well. Did you did you feel it on your end? Um, so the post I felt was very performative. So it was people who didn't actively engage in anti-racism. And so it wasn't really, there was no solidarity. Uh, indigenous people, at least in my experience, we didn't feel any real connection to this as, again, it was performative and it really didn't benefit indigenous or black folk. Danny Joe, how about you? 
I mean, I think I think everything's been said. I think um it's interesting. Nobody thought of this as the genuine thing, eh? Nobody thought, wow, isn't this great? These people are all showing how they want to be allies of ours. And uh, I'm really impressed with that. You didn't take that away, yeah, eh? No, and I, I, I also think there's, there's a difference between intention and impact with these conversations. And so while I genuinely believe that a lot, and it's not most of the Post's intention was, was sincere, um, I think we, we need to start evaluating impact when we have these conversations. So, you know, the road to hell, as we all know, is paved with great intentions. Um, and so I think the first question with anyone, you know, who's trying to follow such social media trends is, what is the impact of this going to have? And sometimes, um, you know, posting a black square if you're not active on social media is, is completely null and void versus, you know, a conversation that you can have at home versus getting engaged in if you're an artist in your own, you know, artist community. I think people need to find their own lanes for change as opposed to kind of following um, and, and anticipating what others are doing. And only then will we be able to, to move the needle, uh, move the dial a little bit further. Sarah, is it possible to interpret this as saying, hmm, I learned something on social media that I didn't know before, and even though it's not actual activism, it's just sort of putting something on my radar screen, did you think maybe it can lead to something more concrete? I think there's, on on a very like su superficial level, I think there is value in its symbolic value in terms of raising awareness. Perhaps someone who had never engaged with these issues is now overwhelmed with seeing all these black squares and that curiosity leads them into their journey into anti-racism, right? Um, so I think that it can potentially plant seeds, but I definitely think that it's just a preliminary marker to do your own self-exploration and your own kind of heavy lifting or our own heavy lifting, myself included. So Isaiah, when you saw, as I presume you did, when you saw the social media campaign and you saw the little black squares at the end of the tweets, did it do anything for you? No, um, you know, it may have planted a seed, but it, there was no real information in it. You know, some people put hashtags with it that were like hashtag Black Lives Matter, but that didn't give anyone information or didn't direct anyone to a source that could help them further their own education and knowledge on anti-racism, specifically anti-Black racism. Okay, let's move along here. And I want to raise another issue with uh, you folks, and that is intersectionality and community. And I think, again, I never like to assume that everybody understands uh, who's watching or listening right now, that they understand all the terms that we talk about on this program. So let's, uh, and Isaiah, I'll start with you. Intersectionality means what? Um, in the most simplest way, it really means just identities that interconnect with one another. So someone who is Indigenous and queer, they have an Indigenous queer intersectionality. And their lived experiences would be a bit different from then an Indigenous person who is cisgendered and heterosexual. And I presume you didn't pick that example um, out of left field. I presume there's a reason you picked that example. Yeah, so in my own lived experience, I am Two-Spirit and Mi'kmaq, which means I intersect with Indigenous identity and queer community. And so my lived experience would be very different from an Indigenous person who does not know anything about gender diversity. A different experience, but take the next step. Do you feel you are particularly more discriminated against because of this intersectionality of your being? Uh, well, within the Indigenous community, we are very gender positive. Traditionally, we did not have gender-specific rules or roles besides perhaps caring of the home and gathering food. And so I know generally I do sometimes feel, especially within the school community, I'm a bit polarized or ostracized because I do present as someone who is perhaps queer or two-spirit, and people don't really know what that means sometimes. And so I often find myself having to explain what Two-Spirit is and why that's significant to my identity. And do you feel you're ostracized within the Indigenous world as well? Not often in the urban Indigenous community, 
but part of colonialism is in, is pushing gender roles and colonial ideologies on indigenous people. So you can really see the homophobia or transphobia within more rural indigenous communities. All right, Ariana, let me get you back in here. And again, in this attempt to sort of create allyship, which is the focus of our discussion here, you told us earlier you are a member of Italians for Black Lives Matter. Now tell us about how that came about and how it's sort of influenced your thinking on things. Yeah, so Italian Canadians for Black Lives um, was a collection um, of Italian Canadians, specifically living in Vaughan, uh, who came together to action on some of the calls for allyship and solidarity that we'd heard from Black Vaughan uh, residents, community activists. Um, and it was really an attempt to mobilize our community and have really important intracommunal conversations with white Italians. Uh, and white Italian Canadians who hold a huge amount of power in the city of Vaughan, whether that be from our city councillors, our mayor, our school board officials, our business owners. Um, and so we really saw a need to speak to this huge power base and organize uh, as a community in support of our other community members. And how is that mission going? I mean, I would say that... Um, it's going quite well. I, I think we're always looking to learn and grow, uh, but we have had some some really great successes in partnership with other organizations. Um, you know, of mention as a result of a lot of work um, on the part of Black community organizations like Anchor Coalition, Parents of Black Children, and Black Lives for Change. Uh, a school in Vaughan named Vaughan Secondary School was renamed. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, Vaughan is named after a man named Benjamin Vaughn, who was an enslaver uh, and parliamentarian who fought against um, abolition. And so Italian Canadians for Black Lives really worked with these community organizations to bring these conversations to the community, to speak at town halls, to write letters, to make phone calls, because this was an ask that was identified by uh, Black community members in Vaughan. Danny Joe, do you, how do I put this? Are you feeling the love? Do you think this is working? <laughs> um, I, I think it is working. I think that there's a lot of work to, to be done. However, I think, you know, this, this work is a marathon, not a race. It's important to look back and, and acknowledge the progresses that we've made and the conversations that are happening and the, the Googling that's happening as a result. It doesn't stop there, obviously. And so I'm hoping that um, the last two years will serve as pedestals from which, you know, we can collectively learn a little bit more about how to show up, um, yeah, for one another in community, which was your your initial point, um, and in solidarity. How do you know, Danny Joe, if it's the real thing? How do you know if it's genuine allyship or if it's rather, you know, and I'm obviously not alleging that in this case, but, you know, there are all sorts of people or companies or organizations or institutions out there that are doing this. Um, strictly for the bottom line or strictly for good public relations purposes, but maybe not because they genuinely in their bones are into allyship. How, do, how can mm. you tell the difference? That's a great question. And I actually did a post on that the other day. Um, I think there's, there are kind of three markers for me in terms of, and let's, let's say, let's talk about brands specifically. Um, I think continuous conversations around um, the lived experiences of folks from a particular community so be it the Black community, be it the Indigenous community, be it the Asian uh, Canadian community who's also been going through quite a lot of anti-racism. And so I think acknowledging and continuous conversations throughout the year and not just you know, for Black History Month and for Indigenous Month, one shows genuine solidarity. I think number two, if you're going to be working with folks and if you're going to be um, you know, asking for the, the time and the labor of uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, paying them for their work is another form of um, genuinity for me. It, it, you're not just asking folks to do free emotional labor that can uh, re-trigger some, some trauma for them. And then the last point is, you know, in addition to talking about the suffering and the pain, and I think just celebrating and having instances of joy um, and, you know, talking about Indigenous healing, talking about, you know, supporting Indigenous entrepreneurship, 
centering indigenous voices at the heart of the environmental movements who they have been spearheading. So I think there's other ways also than just, um, you know, difficult, hard conversations. It doesn't have to be this exhausting all of the time and um, knowing when to kind of shift gears all the while decentering yourselves is for me, the biggest marker of sincerity. Gotcha. Sarah, I, uh, in our just remaining moments here, I want to raise the issue of language because I'm going to guess that some of the words and or expressions we've heard in the last half an hour during the course of our discussion are words that many of our viewers will have never heard before. And let's acknowledge off the top, I think more of our viewers are closer to my age than your age. And they've never heard expressions like micro intimacies and intersectionality. And, and in fact, probably before last year or the year before, they'd never heard the word allyship before either. I'm not saying this to be critical. I'm just saying that's the way it is. How much obligation do you, Sarah, as somebody who is trying to create more allyship in this world, how much obligation do you feel to speak in a language that the people you want to bring in as your allies can understand, as opposed to using vocabulary that your generation gets but maybe others don't. I think accessibility is very important by all means, right? Um, we want to be able to to be able to cross communicate and and kind of share knowledge in that way. Um, there are some terminologies that you kind of just can't zoom across. So intersectionality actually came out of the '80s um, by a black legal scholar named. Kimberly Crenshaw. So Kimberly Crenshaw's work has been around a long time in academia, but it's now transcending more into kind of this mainstream vocabulary amongst our generation. But I still think that words like that, while they need to be defined and shared, I don't necessarily think there's another word to replace intersectionality. Um, so I think that the work has to kind of hold on to that integrity of like using the specific language around um, yeah, intersectionality, community, solidarity, allyship. I think these words are just words we have to further investigate and perhaps make more accessible through its definitions. But I think the word has to still exist in our vocabulary. So, Ariana, uh, I guess, let me see if I can put it this way. So the older generations, it's incumbent upon them, too, to at least meet you halfway and acknowledge that there are going to be new ways of describing these things, new understandings that are required. And um, I'm trying to figure out how to bridge that generation gap. I'm trying to figure out how to get both sides talking to each other in a language both sides can understand. So I'm I'm hearing from I'm I'm hearing from Sarah that there are some words that I'm sorry, you older folks are just gonna have to you're gonna have to open your minds and you're just gonna have to give this a try. Is that it? Yeah, well, I think that that's actually what can emerge when you build intragenerational or intergenerational communities, right? Where you have um, opportunities to talk with people of an older generation and explain your perspectives and then, you know, hear from them, you know, these are the things I don't understand about it. And that actually can help us to refine the language that we use to talk about this. Um, and I, and so I, I think that it is about meeting each other where we're at. Um, and working together to help each other as lifelong learners. You know, uh, our generation also doesn't, my generation doesn't know everything. Um, there's a lot that we have to learn. And I think the point of community building is saying like, let's learn and together, let's, let's figure this out as a community. Meeting each other where we're at. That is an expression I can get my head around. Uh, I wanna thank the four of you for coming on to TVO tonight for a really fascinating discussion. Uh, Ariana Malioko, Danny Joe Oto, Isaiah Shafkat, Sarah Barzak. Great to have you on TVO, you four. Thanks so much. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thank you for having us. This pandemic has put so many things on hold, and the evidence of these unusual times shows up in one very clear way for many people, in their photos, or lack of photos maybe. With us to explain, let's welcome, in Edmonton, Alberta, photographer Dallas Curo. In Montreal, Quebec, journalist Marissa Colton. And in Vaughan, Ontario, photographer Jenny Jay.
Great to have you three with us here on TVO tonight. I want to start by just sharing the results of a survey that McPaw did on users of a photo managing app to compare their photography habits before and then since the pandemic hit. And here we go. People who take photos every day, there's been a 23% decrease. How about people who look at older photos every day? A 38% increase. And how about people who are never taking videos anymore? That is an 80% increase. Let's dive in. Jenny, to you first. Has there been a change in the ways that you capture memories through photography pre-pandemic compared to post-pandemic? Absolutely. First and foremost, um, especially since I am a professional photographer, there used to be so many more opportunities to take photos of my family and my friends and my loved ones with my camera. Um, I definitely find that because I'm at home uh, more often and for so long, especially with all of the different lockdowns, um, I'm taking so many more photos on my phone than I actually was with my professional gear. Um, and on top of that, I, as an individual, I'm definitely taking less um, because I'm not necessarily getting up and getting dressed and going out and doing all the same things that we were pre-pandemic. Um, so there's a little bit of like less motivation to want to take those photos of yourselves and more of an effort. Marissa, how about you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, pre-pandemic, I was, I, I was always taking photos of, you know, um, uh, myself, my friends, um, you know, uh, I was studying abroad at the time, uh, so there was a lot that I wanted to capture, a lot that I wanted to remember. Um, and when the pandemic hit, I just didn't, I just didn't have the same drive to to capture photos and to capture memories because it wasn't exactly uh, something I wanted to remember. Um, but you know, as the pandemic continued on, um, you know, I realized it was going to be much longer than uh, I initially thought, and I, you know. I noticed that there was the absence of photos in, in my photo library. And then I said to myself, you know, maybe I should continue to capture photos. Maybe it'll, maybe it's important to, to document this moment, um, you know, and continue to continue to make memories, uh, even in spite of the pandemic. Dallas, have things changed for you? Yes, uh, most certainly. I would say the starkest contrast I noticed on a personal level uh, because I actually had my second child during the first week of the pandemic. Um, so the way that I documented her arrival at home and the her social life um, in her earliest days was very different. I found I actually had to manufacture experiences and outings, most of which were just going outside to the park, um, so that she would have memories and feel that I did document her newborn days. Uh, whereas my son, who was born in 2017, you know, he was out socializing and meeting people right away. So we have all those documents. So I find um, on a personal level, I definitely am like almost manufacturing these experiences and making a conscious effort, as Jenny said, to um, to really force myself <laughs> to take more photos from my own life. And uh, for my clientele, it certainly changed as well. So that that child of yours, I presume, is coming up to her second birthday very shortly? That's right, March 24th. March 24th. And the, the pictures, I guess, from the first couple of years of her life are completely different from the pictures from the first couple of years of your son's life, I'm guessing. Is that right? Entirely. Um, my son is in pictures of him being held by family and friends, for example, and um, doing indoor activities. And my daughter, it's all just us at home or family walks or being in the park at a distance from friends. So I think there's a visual document of the stark differences in the early days, for sure. And let me do one more follow-up with you because you mentioned uh, having to deal with your clients. What have you observed from working with your clients about how things are different post-pandemic versus pre-pandemic? Well, first of all, I made the decision to step away from photographing weddings um, because quite early on, I just thought, okay, I'm not booking anymore because this will be a logistical nightmare for probably a couple of years to come. Uh, not a prediction that I'm happy to have been right <laughs> in making, but uh, I did make that decision to step away from large events and focus on um, more commercial work and working one-on-one -on -one with business owners and situations that could be a little bit more controlled and comfortable for me. Hmm. Jenny, how about wedding photography for you? Anything there? 
Um, in the last season, I completely agree with what she was saying. Uh, it's changed so much. Um, so I do branding photography as well as uh, wedding and personal photography. And in the wedding side of things, it was quiet, 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 um, especially until uh, the restrictions in Ontario changed in the beginning of July. And then from July to November, it's actually been the busiest season we've had in the last three years. Um, and I know a lot of other wedding photographers who worked this season um, also felt the same. It was last minute bookings. It was very hectic. Um, and it's just it's supposed to be like the biggest boom that's also happened in a very finite amount of time as a result of all the weddings that were pushed back in 2020 all the last minute weddings that people decided to do all the weddings people had really soon to their engagement because they just wanted to make it happen uh so yeah massively different jenny uh, this may sound like a dumb question but but when you're doing a wedding during covid mm -hmm. are you masked up when you're taking your pictures um, absolutely, because there are large groups. Um, they are, you know, we're, we're doing quite a number. So myself and uh, my partner, who's also my second shooter, um, will both be double masks and have our precautions in place. Is there a difference? Do you notice a difference in your relationship with the camera when there's a piece of cloth between you and it? I actually think I've gotten really used to it. At first, it was really hard, um, but I think I've gotten used to it. It just gets a little suffocating sometimes. <laughs> Marissa, how about you? Any different approach to the way you take pictures now versus two years ago? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I, I used to be shooting, um, you know, landscapes and, um, you know, events that I would attend and things like that. Uh, now, the majority of the photos that I take are just screen caps of, say, FaceTimes and um, calls that I do with family here and abroad. Um, so I'm taking more screen captures than, than actual photos uh, because I realize that I prefer photos where I'm actually interacting with somebody else. Um, you know, whereas uh, now in the pandemic, I spend a lot of time on my own, working from home. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just a lot of just a lot of screen captures now as opposed to actual photos. And uh, let me follow up on those numbers that we presented at the top, which is to say we've got a lot more people right now reminiscing over older photos as opposed to taking newer photos. Is that your experience as well? Yes, absolutely. I find that looking back at old photos can actually really boost my mood in this pandemic. You know, looking back um, at moments where, you know, we were we were having a great time and we, we could have never anticipated that things would turn out this way. Um, and so I find that looking back at those photos uh, is a real boost in my mood. Um, you know, it, it's nice to remember times where where you could have fun without um, without thinking about, you know, without having this this pandemic kind of as the undercurrent. Um, so I do enjoy looking back at old photos. Jenny, how about you? More time with old pictures these days? Definitely. Um, it's really funny. So right before the pandemic, we were traveling quite a lot for our clients. We went to California. We were in Maui. Um, and I think between a partner and I, we like really romanticize those trips now because it was like the last thing and like the place that we went to before the pandemic. Um, we also look massively different. Like just seasons have changed, the way COVID has affected us. Um, and it's really funny. We have a photo of myself and my partner six months into the pandemic. Um, and not going to lie, like I look back at that photo actually to look at how rough like we looked the six months <laughs> into the pandemic. Um, you know, my partner's hair was like thinning a little, like I was just not, not doing so great. Um, but I'm glad at least I have that one moment as a reflection of, you know, something happened, something big happened there in that photo. And now we can start to see like what it looks like on this side of still being in a pandemic, uh, but almost, what, two, two, three years later. Right. Well, speaking of what it looks like, we would like to show folks what some of Dallas's work looks like. And uh, Dallas, I'm going to, there we go. Thank you, Sheldon. I'm going to ask Sheldon if he would just sort of scroll through this, I gather you call it the safekeeping series, which you shot during the pandemic. 
And maybe you could tell us where the inspiration for this came from and what you wanted to do with it. Absolutely. Uh, this series came during my postpartum period when I was feeling really down and having a tough time being at home with my daughter and not being able to introduce her to the world as, as we had discussed. And uh, I knew, I know that I was far from the only mother feeling this sense of isolation. So I thought it would be fun to do a project celebrating the emotional resilience of mothers during the pandemic and all the emotional labor they were doing. Women were so um, devastatingly affected by the pandemic, having to leave the workforce in droves um, and just take over all caregiving responsibilities. And I wanted to celebrate them and also give them something beautiful from this moment where they couldn't be with family, couldn't have support, had to carry a burden and shield their children from it. Um, so I actually used windows and had the, the mothers and their children be behind the windows um, as a memory of this time of social distancing and, and really sheltering in place. Like this was earlier on in the pandemic when we were not uh, getting out much. <laughs> See, now th that's a, I mean, I don't, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. That's a fabulous picture there. I, I, I mean, I love everything about that picture. And I just wonder Thank when you, Steve. you. I appreciate that so much. This family not was at absolutely all. I mean, amazing. Those young girls how, were so yeah, joyful. Look, look how fabulous they look. And you've got the reflection of the trees in there too. It's just a, it's a, it's a great shot. You call it the safekeeping series. Where did that name come from? Well, I thought about the name forever, <laughs> and I originally was going to call it Women Through Windows, but I wanted it to be more than just a name and the setting. I wanted it to really symbolize what mothers were giving as a gift to their children, um, because we all did make a lot of personal sacrifices. Everybody has, well, most people, um, and we've all made changes to our lives that we have, would have never wanted to make. So the mothers were really sheltering in place, keeping their children safe and doing everything they could. Um, so it was really a tribute to them, the name. Do you think of yourself in some respects more as an historian as opposed to a photographer? I mean, you really are capturing a particular moment in history, which, I mean, God willing, we haven't experienced for a hundred years and hopefully won't experience for another hundred years, if ever. Well, I think all photographers by nature are historians, but we don't necessarily realize it until a certain amount of time has passed. For me, and I'm sure Jenny has had this experience as well as a wedding photographer, we often um, unwillingly become historians when people that we photograph from weddings pass away. And I've had a lot of past clients reach out to me and say, this person's service is approaching and you took the best picture of them that we ever had. Like, could you send us a large file so we could print it for the funeral? That's happened to me, sadly, too many times. Um, but this, to me, was the first time where I really thought I want to create something that can document the feeling of being in this time as a mother and really stand for what we were all kind of doing and feeling at the time. Cool. Let's share some more numbers here. Sheldon, I'm going to ask you to bring up these Chapter 3 numbers here. This is the change in the kinds of content that have been created during the course of this pandemic, and this first number is not going to surprise anybody. There's apparently been an 80% decrease in travel photos. Well, duh, right? There's been a 112% increase in pet photos. That's also probably not very surprising. And 68% increase in food photos. Yes, of course, when we can't show the wonderful places we've been traveling to, we'll just show people what's on our plates. Uh, Marissa, start us off on this. The lack of traveling, the lack of socializing. Does that, I suppose, uh, prompt you to try to capture the smaller moments in life? Yes, absolutely. I think the subject matter of my photos have changed so much. Um, I'm definitely taking pictures, you know, more around my apartment, more selfies, um, things like that. The, the subject matter has certainly changed. Um, and, you know, what I choose to put out there on social media has changed as well. Uh, it's really made me contend with the, with the fact that, you know, in general on social media, we, we tend to post our most exciting, our most interesting experiences, um, you know, and I've had to kind of uh, contend with that and really question, you know, what I post on social media, why I put it there. 
Um, you know, and so, uh, picture taking pictures around the apartment, you know, might, might not have been social media worthy prior to the pandemic, but, uh, now that now that my my standards you know for a great experience and something interesting memorable have changed um you know what i put out there and what i post has changed as well give me a little example of that marissa in in the past you might have put some fantastic picture from some glorious location up there nowadays it's more what so i mean i might have posted a picture of of you know me at a restaurant with a friend uh you know here in montreal something, something exciting, something fun. But now I might post, you know, picture of me reading in the apartment, you know, doing, doing things that prior to the pandemic might have seemed kind of mundane. But um, now that this is our everyday, this is our daily life, you know, it's, it's worth documenting and, and it's worth putting out there. Jenny, how about you? Do you find yourself taking more pictures of more mundane things these days? I do. And I think the, the less travel photos also really uh, speak out to me um, because I have like this full bank of travel photos. Um, I'm so sorry, my mic keeps turning off. Um, but I think it's just hard to share as many travel photos too because I think we're really conscious of what's happening in online spaces. Um, and as a result, like when people feel like the heaviness about not being able to travel, I think it's also hard to share those kind of images. We're going to have to hire you a new lighting director, Jenny. The, the guy I'm who's so doing it right now just needs to be fired. <laughs> I'm, I'm firing that person. It's all good. Well, that does raise the question about how, how do you manage to take a great picture when the lights are flickering on and off all the time? Does that ever happen to you during a shoot? It doesn't happen during the shoots, but it also really speaks out to, like, we've had to take some photos in interesting places as a result of the lockdowns, like not being able to have access to certain studios, things changing last minute. Um, so at least definitely speaks to the resilience of making the best out of any space. Right on. Dallas, what do you find yourself taking pictures of now that before the pandemic, it wouldn't have occurred to you to take the picture because you thought, oh, God, that's too boring or too, mon too mundane or just not important enough to capture? Well, I would say two things, Steve. Uh, on a micro level at my home, um, I've been getting more interested in um, home decorating and decor. So I've been styling different objects and books. <laughs> I guess you can see all my knickknacks behind me here. Um, and just kind of puttering around in my house a little bit more and, and taking photos of that. And then on a, a macro level, uh, we've been traveling more, but within our own backyard. Um, I'm, I'm an Ontario native, so I'm, I'm relatively new to Alberta. So discovering the outdoors has been fabulous, especially as I'm more of an indoor cat myself. Um, the pandemic has forced me to become outdoorsy and bring my camera with me. So going to the Rocky Mountains and our favorite is Canmore. Uh, we also love Banff and uh, of course Jasper. So really going there with my family and exploring like the beautiful landscapes that Canada has to offer. Extraordinary, isn't it? It really, saw, I remember the first time I saw the Rocky Mountains, I could not believe how just absolutely glorious they were. But I'm wondering as an Ontario kid, what do you think of minus 25 in Alberta? It's a dry cold, Steve. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> can you, now I should ask you this, can you actually take pictures outdoors in, in like minus 25, minus 30? Can your fingers operate on those conditions? Uh, fingers, questionable, but uh, battery power <laughs> is an issue. Um, you better make sure you pack like four times the amount of batteries because the cold just drains their life force very quickly. Marissa, what do you, I mean, Montreal is a miserably cold place too sometimes during the wintertime. What's your outdoor shooting experience like? Uh, you're absolutely right that it can be miserably cold. Um, but, you know, Montreal has a lot of interesting outdoor art installations. So, you know, occasionally I'll take pictures of those and you take pictures of the facades of buildings and things like that. Um, so a lot of there's a lot of outdoor photography happening, but luckily Montreal is a place where, um, you know, there is a lot there is a lot to shoot outside. So uh, that's a blessing. Very true. Montreal is a beautiful city to look at. Jenny, in our last minute here, just talk to us if you would about how photographs, be they exotic or very mundane, can actually console people significantly during tough times like we're going through right now? 
Well, I think speaking earlier to the fact that we are like photographers and photographs are like a documentation of what's happening in your everyday life. Um, and I think they really help tell that story of like what's going on, what's changing, how we've changed, what we're experiencing. Um, and I think just to be able to have some form of record of it, even if it's just the photos mm -hmm. of, you know, the screenshots from fake times or how you're able to connect with family, um, whatever it looks like for you right now, I think having access to that and having the ability to do that it's, it's still a keepsake, even if they look really different, even if there's more pet photos, even if the lighting's wonky, um, you know, there's still keepsakes that people get to have, um, you know, to be able to share because we're literally living history right now. Um, I have eight nieces and nephews and uh, they're going through it. And I know like in 10 years, we're going to talk about, remember when this happened? And um, there's one that was born in the middle of the pandemic as well. And these images that we have right now is going to be how we are able to tell that story down the line to the people who uh, know this time as a piece of history. Well, I want to thank the three of you for joining us on TVO tonight and beyond that for being such wonderfully talented documentarians of the times in which we live. So thank you in Edmonton, Alberta, to Dallas Curo, in Vaughan, Ontario, to photographer Jenny J, and in Montreal, Quebec, to Marissa Colton. You all stay safe out there, and thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me thanks, on, Steve. Steve. Thank you. Uh -huh. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, January 19th, 2022. Tomorrow, the perilous road to recovery from addiction. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.